There's something wrong with Mr. Harris. Everyone on Maple Street knows it. He's the grumpy old man who lives in the last house at the end of the cul-de-sac, the one that always looks a little darker than the rest. Most kids avoid his yard, crossing the street before they even get close, but some can't resist a dare. The challenge was always the same. Knock on Mr. Harris's door, wait for him to answer, then run like hell. Simple, right? That's what Jake thought too. It was a cool October evening when Jake and his friends gathered around the street lamp just a few houses down from Mr. Harris's place. The sun had set and the chilly air had that eerie bite to it, the kind that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. They had been talking about Halloween pranks when someone mentioned the dare. Come on, Jake, said Tyler, his best friend and the group's self-appointed ringleader. You're the only one who hasn't done it. It's your turn. Jake didn't believe in ghosts or the weird rumors surrounding the old man, but there was something about Mr. Harris's house that unsettled him. Still, he wasn't about to back down in front of his friends. He smirked, feigning bravery. Fine. What's the big deal? He's just a cranky old guy. The group fell silent, exchanging uneasy glances. You haven't heard? Tyler leaned in, his voice dropping to a whisper. A few years ago, Mr. Harris had a son about our age. One day, he just disappeared. Some people say Mr. Harris went crazy after that, that he's been talking to his son's ghost ever since since. Jake chuckled nervously. That's just a dumb story. Then prove it, Tyler shot back. Go up there, knock on his door, see if the old man talks to you. Jake swallowed hard but nodded. He didn't believe the ghost stories. Not really. But standing at the edge of Mr. Harris's property, looking up at the decrepit house, doubt crept in. The windows were dark, almost like they were sucking the light out of the street. The overgrown bushes and sagging porch seemed to whisper warnings, urging him to turn back. But Jake couldn't. His friends were watching. He stepped onto the path leading up to the house, the gravel crunching under his sneakers, sounding deafening in the quiet. Every step felt heavier, like the air itself was thickening around him. His heart pounded in his chest, each beat a little louder as he neared the door. When he reached the porch, Jake hesitated. The old wood creaked under his weight. He raised his hand to knock, his fingers hovering just inches from the peeling paint of the front door. His throat was dry, and for a moment he considered turning back. But before he could stop himself, he knocked. The sound echoed, unnaturally loud, as if the house were hollow. Jake waited. Nothing. He exhaled, a laugh of relief slipping past his lips. It had been stupid to be afraid. Maybe Mr. Harris wasn't even home. But then, the door creaked open. Standing in the doorway was Mr. Harris, his face pale and gaunt, his eyes sunken and clouded with age. He stared at Jake, not saying a word. His presence was oppressive, like the air around him was somehow colder, heavier. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Harris, Jake stammered. I, uh, knocked by accident. I'll just... Before he could finish, Mr. Harris's lips curled into a twisted smile. No need to apologize, the old man said, his voice raspy and dry. You're just in time for dinner. Jake's stomach churned. Something about the way Mr. Harris said those words made his skin crawl. Uh, no thanks, Jake muttered, stepping back. I've got to go. But when he tried to move, his feet felt glued to the porch. Panic surged through him as Mr. Harris's smile widened, revealing teeth that were far too sharp, far too white for someone his age. You remind me of my boy? The old man crooned. He was about your age when he disappeared. Jake's heart raced. I, I should really go. Oh, but he's still here, Mr. Harris said, his eyes gleaming with a sinister light. He likes to play with visitors. A cold breeze swept through the doorway, carrying with it the faint sound of whispering. At first, Jake thought it was the wind, but as it grew louder, more distinct, he realized it was a voice, a child's voice. Help me. Jake's blood ran cold. The whisper seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere all at once. His breath quickened, his skin prickling with fear. He looked past Mr. Harris into the dark hallway behind him, and for a split second, he saw a figure, a small boy, standing in the shadows, his eyes wide and hollow. The boy raised a hand, reaching out toward Jake. Help me. Jake jerked back, his heart slamming in his chest. What, what is that? Mr. Harris chuckled softly. He gets lonely, you see. He's been waiting for a friend for so long. The whispers grew louder, more desperate, as the boy's figure began to move closer. The temperature dropped sharply, and Jake's breath fogged in front of him. Every instinct screamed at him to run, but his feet wouldn't move. It was as if the house itself was holding him in place.
The boy stepped out of the shadows, his face pale and sunken like a corpse, his eyes dark and empty. Play with me, the boy whispered, his voice low and haunting. Stay with me. Jake's heart pounded in his ears as the boy reached out to grab him, cold fingers brushing against his skin. In that moment, Jake felt something deep and primal, an overwhelming sense of dread, like he was teetering on the edge of something dark and bottomless. With a desperate cry, he yanked his feet free from the porch and stumbled backward, nearly falling down the steps. He didn't look back as he bolted down the path, his friends' startled voices barely registering in his panic. All he could hear was the echo of that child's whisper, still lingering in his mind. Stay with me. Jake never went near Mr. Harris's house again. No one did. The next morning, the house was boarded up and a for sale sign appeared on the lawn. No one knew where Mr. Harris had gone and no one cared to ask. But sometimes when the wind blows just right on a cold October night, you can still hear a faint whisper floating through the air. Stay with me. Story number two. In the quaint little town of Maplewood, nestled between rolling hills and whispering forests, lived a man named Frank Thompson. Frank was a solitary figure, often seen tending to his garden or sitting on his porch, watching the world go by. Despite his quiet demeanor, he was a source of fascination and fear among the townsfolk. They whispered about him in hushed tones, sharing stories of his late wife, Eliza, who had vanished mysteriously two years prior. As the seasons changed, Frank's behavior grew increasingly peculiar. The once vibrant flowers in his garden wilted and his neatly kept lawn became overrun with weeds. His eyes, once a bright blue, now seemed to be clouded, reflecting a deep sadness and an unsettling obsession. Many speculated that he was still mourning his wife, while others believed he was hiding a dark secret. It was during this time that a young couple, Jake and Emily, moved in next door. They were excited to start a new life in Maplewood, drawn by its charm and close-knit community. However, they quickly became aware of Frank's presence. At first, they tried to befriend him, inviting him over for coffee and attempting to include him in their lives. But Frank would always decline, retreating into his home with a polite smile and an eerie aura. One fateful night as a storm brewed outside, Jake and Emily were cozied up on their couch watching a movie. Thunder rattled the windows and lightning illuminated their living room in brief, blinding flashes. Suddenly, a loud bang erupted from Frank's house, causing them to jump. Concerned, Emily suggested they check on him, but Jake hesitated, feeling an inexplicable sense of dread. We can't just leave him, Emily insisted, her compassion winning over Jake's reservations. They grabbed their raincoats and made their way through the pouring rain to Frank's front door. They knocked softly, but there was no answer. The wind howled around them, and the darkness seemed to swallow the light. Just as they were about to leave, they noticed a flickering light coming from the back of the house. Curiosity peaked. They made their way around to the rear yard. What they saw left them breathless. The back garden, once overgrown and neglected, was transformed into a macabre display. Frank had hung hundreds of photographs from the trees, each capturing moments of his life with Eliza. However, the images were dark and distorted, showing Eliza's face twisted in agony, her eyes wide with fear. It was as if he was trying to relive the moments leading up to her disappearance. Jake, we should go, Emily whispered, fear creeping into her voice. But Jake, transfixed by the scene, stepped closer to get a better look. As he did, he felt a chill sweep through the air and the hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. Do you think he's okay? Jake asked, glancing back at Emily. Before she could respond, the back door creaked open and Frank appeared, silhouetted against the light. His face was pale and his eyes seemed to glisten with an otherworldly sheen. What are you doing here? He asked, his voice low and gravelly, echoing in the eerie stillness. Emily stepped back, a lump forming in her throat. We, we just wanted to check on you, Frank, she stammered. We heard a noise. Frank's gaze drifted to the photographs, and for a moment, a flicker of something dark crossed his face. She's always here with me, he said, almost to himself. You can't take her away. He stepped closer, and Jake felt a wave of dread wash over him. Frank, we just want to help you, Jake tried to reason, but before he could finish, Frank's demeanor shifted. A cruel smile spread across his lips, and he turned his head slightly, as if listening to something just beyond the reach of human ears. 
Suddenly, a low, haunting wail echoed through the yard, chilling them to the bone. Frank's smile faded, replaced by a look of desperation. No, you can't take her, he screamed, throwing his arms up as if trying to shield himself from an unseen force. Jake grabbed Emily's hand and they bolted for the front of the house, fear propelling them forward. As they reached their porch, they turned to see Frank standing in the yard, his body trembling. You don't understand. She needs me, he cried out, his voice now filled with rage and sorrow. The wailing grew louder, and shadows flickered around him, writhing like phantoms in the night. Terrified, Jake and Emily hurried inside their home, slamming the door behind them. Heart pounding, Jake locked the door and turned to Emily, who was visibly shaken. We need to call someone, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. They dialed the local sheriff, explaining the bizarre incident, but when the officer arrived, Frank was nowhere to be found. His home was dark and silent as if it had never been disturbed. The officer assured them it was like likely just a storm-induced scare and left, but they couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. That night, sleep eluded them. Every creak and groan of their house felt amplified, and the storm raged on outside. Around midnight, they heard soft knocks on their door. Heart racing, Jake peeked through the window but saw only darkness. He turned to Emily, and before they could decide what to do, the knocks became frantic. Jake, I'm scared. Emily whispered, clutching his arm. He took a deep breath and opened the door slightly, peeking outside. The storm had settled, but the air felt heavy, charged with an eerie stillness. Frank? Jake called out tentatively. Flake. There was no response, just the sound of rustling leaves. Suddenly, a figure darted past him, slipping through the door. Emily screamed as the door swung open, revealing Frank, his face twisted in anguish. Help me! She won't let me go! He shouted his eyes wild with terror. As he stumbled into their living room, the temperature dropped and the lights flickered. Who won't let you go? Emily demanded, stepping back, feeling a strange pull towards Frank. In that moment, a chilling wind whipped through the room and the shadows coalesced around Frank, revealing a ghostly figure hovering just behind him. It was Eliza, her face as distorted as in the photographs, a look of torment etched across her features. Help me, please, Frank begged, his voice cracking. She wants me to stay. Jake and Emily exchanged terrified glances as the ghostly figure moved closer, reaching for Frank with long, skeletal fingers. You brought them here, Eliza whispered, her voice a haunting echo. You must choose, Frank. Stay with me or let them go. The choice weighed heavily in the air, and in that moment, the truth became clear. Frank was trapped, bound to the memory of his wife, consumed by grief and guilt. He had lost himself in the darkness, and now Eliza was dragging him down with her. No, Frank cried, shaking his head violently. I won't let her take me. With a surge of desperation, he lunged for the door, but the shadows wrapped around him, pulling him back. Choose, Eliza screamed, her voice echoing like thunder. The room shook, and the air crackled with energy as the battle raged between love and despair. In a moment of clarity, Frank turned to Jake and Emily, tears streaming down his face. You have to help me. You can't let her take me, he pleaded. They stepped forward, determination igniting within them. Together, they reached for Frank, pulling him away from the darkness. In that instant, Eliza's anguished wail filled the room, shattering glass and causing the walls to tremble. With one final cry, Frank broke free from the shadows, stumbling into Jake and Emily's arms. The ghostly figure shrieked, dissipating into a cloud of darkness as the light flickered back to life. Breathless and trembling, Frank collapsed to the floor, his body shaking. Thank you, he gasped, his eyes wide with fear. I thought I was lost forever. But as they looked around, they realized the fight was far from over. The air felt charged with energy, and the shadows lingered, waiting for their next opportunity. Frank, still haunted by the loss of Eliza, knew they needed to confront the darkness before it consumed them all. We need to leave this place, Emily said, her voice trembling. We can't let her win. As they gathered their things and prepared to leave Maplewood behind, Frank looked back at the shadows that danced in the corners of the room. I'll find a way to set her free, he vowed, determination igniting within him. With a final glance at the life he once knew, he stepped outside, ready to face whatever lay ahead. As they drove away from Maplewood, Frank felt a flicker of hope amidst the darkness. Perhaps in facing his fears, he could finally lay Eliza's spirit to rest, freeing them both from the chains of the past.
Story number three. In a quiet suburb, nestled among neatly trimmed lawns and white picket fences, lived a woman named Martha. She was known around the neighborhood as the pet lover. Every year, she hosted a block party where she showcased her beloved pets, a multitude of cats, dogs, and even a parrot that seemed to have an attitude of its own. But there was something about Martha that always sent a shiver down the spines of her neighbors, especially the newcomers. When the Johnsons moved in next door, they were eager to meet Martha, intrigued by the tales they'd heard about her menagerie. The Johnsons had a golden retriever named Max, who was friendly and loved meeting new friends. One sunny Saturday morning, Mrs. Johnson decided to pay Martha a visit, bringing along a plate of cookies as a peace offering. As she knocked on the door, it creaked open, revealing Martha standing there, her wild gray hair framing a face that seemed to hold an eerie serenity. She was clad in a faded floral dress, and around her ankles a swarm of cats wound their way in and out, meowing softly. Welcome, Martha said, her voice like a gentle caress. Come in, dear. The pets will love you. Mrs. Johnson stepped inside, hesitating as a wave of cold air brushed past her. The living room was an odd mix of cozy and chaotic. Pet toys littered the floor, and shelves overflowed with framed photographs of Martha with her animals. The walls were decorated with animal portraits, and the air was thick with the scent of pet food and something more pungent, something that sent a knot of unease twisting in Mrs. Johnson's stomach. Oh, don't mind the mess, Martha laughed leading her into the backyard where dozens of animals lounged in the sun. They're just so happy to be free. Isn't that right, Fluffy? She gestured to a giant cat that seemed to rule the roost. But as Mrs. Johnson looked closer, she noticed something strange. The animals weren't just lounging, they were watching her with unnerving intensity. Their eyes glowed strangely in the sunlight, and for a moment she felt as if she was being weighed and measured. Martha, your pets are lovely, Mrs. Johnson said, forcing a smile. How do you take care of so many? Oh, they take care of me just as much, Martha replied, her gaze growing distant. They're all I have left. A shiver ran down Mrs. Johnson's spine, but she brushed it off, attributing it to the cold breeze that seemed to swirl through the yard. Over the next few weeks, the Johnsons became regular visitors. Mr. Johnson was particularly fond of Max, and often brought him over to play with Martha's dogs. One evening, while the men chatted on the porch, Mrs. Johnson wandered inside to use the bathroom. As she walked through the house, she stumbled upon a room she hadn't noticed before. A small study, dimly lit, with stacks of old newspapers and pet food cans spilling out of boxes. But it was the wall that captured her attention. It was covered in photographs of pets, some familiar, some not. Yet, there was something eerily wrong about them. Each picture featured Martha, but each animal looked increasingly gaunt and sickly. There were even a few photos of animals Mrs. Mocke, Johnson recognized as having passed away in the neighborhood, pets that had mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Just a little collection of my favorites, Martha's voice suddenly came from behind her. Those were special friends. Mrs. Johnson turned to face Martha, her heart racing. I, I didn't know you had so many pets. They're all special, Martha whispered, leaning closer. But you know, some just aren't meant to stay long. A chill washed over Mrs. F. Johnson as she realized that Martha's smile had twisted into something unsettling. She hurried back outside, trying to shake off the feeling of dread that clung to her. Weeks turned into months, and the Johnsons kept their distance from Martha. But they still heard odd noises at night, howling that didn't quite sound like any of the animals they knew. The neighbors began to whisper about Martha, speculating on the true nature of her peculiar passion for pets. One evening, as a storm rolled in, Mr. Johnson took Max out for a quick walk. The rain fell in heavy sheets, drenching everything in its path. As he stood in front of Martha's house, he heard something, a low, mournful cry coming from the backyard. He glanced over, peering through the iron gate that separated their yards. The scene was bizarre. Martha stood in the center of her yard, her arms raised toward the sky, surrounded by her pets. They were all staring at her, their eyes reflecting the flashes of lightning. Martha began to chant softly, her voice barely audible over the storm. Suddenly, the animals started to howl in unison, a spine-chilling sound that echoed through the night. Mr. Johnson's stomach dropped. He had never heard anything like it before. The howling intensified, and with each flash of lightning, 
He saw Martha's face contort in ecstasy, almost like she was feeding off their energy. Max whimpered at his side, sensing the tension in the air. Mr. Johnson felt a sense of urgency to leave, pulling Max away from the gate. He could still hear the howling as they retreated back to their home, the noise gradually fading into the distance. That night, the storm worsened, thunder rumbled like a beast, and rain lashed against the windows. The couple huddled under a blanket, trying to distract themselves from the uneasy feeling that settled in their chests. But sleep eluded them, as the haunting sounds of howling persisted outside. Days passed and strange things began to happen. Pets in the neighborhood started to go missing. First, it was the Smith's Beagle, then the Henderson's Cat. The community was on high alert, fearing that something sinister lurked nearby. Whispers grew louder, pointing fingers at Martha. One evening, Mrs. Johnson couldn't bear the tension anymore. She decided to confront Martha, hoping to clear the air. She knocked on the door, but there was no answer. As she turned to leave, she heard a soft meowing coming from the side of the house. Curiosity peaked. She followed the sound, which led her to a small, hidden shed. The door creaked open, revealing a sight that made her blood run cold. Inside were cages, filled with the neighborhood's missing pets. They looked frail, eyes wide with fear, some huddled together for comfort. Before she could process what she saw, Martha appeared behind her, her expression unreadable. You shouldn't have come here, she said softly, her voice like ice. They're mine now. They belong with me. In a panic, Mrs. Johnson bolted from the shed, sprinting toward her home. As she reached her front porch, she heard the howling again, louder this time, echoing through the night. She fumbled for her keys, hands trembling as she unlocked the door. But it was too late. The moment she stepped inside, she felt the air grow thick and heavy. The pets that had once felt like family were now shadows of their former selves, trapped in a house filled with darkness. From that day on, the Johnsons kept their distance. The howling never ceased, and Martha continued to lure unsuspecting neighbors into her web of pet obsession. The block party was never mentioned again, and as time went on, the neighborhood fell silent, the only sounds echoing through the air being the haunting cries of lost pets. One stormy night, the Johnsons heard a knock on their door. When they opened it, there was no one there, just the silhouette of a figure standing at the edge of Martha's yard a familiar golden retriever by her side. Max whined softly, and as they looked closer, the figure turned, revealing Martha's eerie smile, her pets circling around her like lost souls forever trapped in her clutches. As the storm raged on, the howls of the forgotten grew louder, resonating through the night, a chilling reminder that once you entered the world of the pet lover neighbor, there was no turning back. Story number four. For as long as anyone could remember, old Mrs. Warwick had lived at the end of Pine Street. Her house, weather-beaten and leaning slightly to one side, sat at the edge of the woods like a forgotten relic from a different time. No one in the neighborhood really knew her. She rarely came outside, and when she did, she would glare at anyone who dared cross her path, her eyes filled with disdain. The kids called her the grumpy neighbor, but their parents whispered darker things. She was always strange, Mr. Thatcher from across the street would say. Since her husband disappeared, she's only gotten worse. No one disappears without a trace like that, Mrs. Hendricks added. If you ask me, she had something to do with it. Rumors spread like wildfire. Some claimed Mrs. Warwick practiced dark magic. Others said she spoke to the dead. But no one had ever seen anything to confirm it. And as kids often do, they turned fear into a game, a dare. That's how Mark, Jamie, and Sophie found themselves standing at the edge of Mrs. Warwick's driveway one chilly autumn afternoon. Come on, Mark, Jamie said, her voice wavering slightly. You said you'd do it. I know, I know, Mark replied, trying to steady his breathing. But it's different standing here. She's probably just a weird old lady. Sophie glanced toward the house. The windows were dark, the curtains drawn. The front yard was overgrown with weeds, and the once white picket fence was now a decaying gray. But what unnerved them most was the eerie silence surrounding the place, like the house itself was holding its breath. No one's been in there for years, Sophie whispered. I heard she doesn't even go outside anymore. Mark swallowed hard. The dare was simple. Knock on Mrs. Warwick's door and run. But as he stood at the edge of her property, his confidence wavered. The air felt wrong, heavy with something he couldn't quite explain. 
Fine, he said, more to convince himself than his friends. I'll do it. He took a step onto the cracked walkway, and immediately the air seemed to grow colder. His heart pounded in his chest, but he forced his legs to move. With every step, the house loomed larger, its shadow stretching across the yard as the sun dipped lower in the sky. Finally, Mark reached the front door. His hands trembled as he raised his fist to knock. Just three quick taps, then he'd be done. He took a deep breath, then knocked. Tap! 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 The sound echoed hollowly through the house. For a moment, there was only silence. Mark's heart raced as he turned to leave, but before he could take a step, the door creaked open behind him. He froze. Slowly, he turned back to the door, expecting to see Mrs. Warwick standing there, glaring at him. But the doorway was empty, the house beyond it shrouded in darkness. Mark, let's go, Jamie called from the street, her voice trembling. Mark's instincts screamed at him to run, but something inside the house drew him closer. He could feel it, like a cold hand pulling him toward the threshold. He stepped inside. The air was thick with the scent of dust and decay. The hallway stretched before him, dimly lit by a single flickering light bulb. The walls were lined with old, faded photographs, but as Mark glanced at them, his blood ran cold. The photos, they were of people from the neighborhood, families, kids, but the faces were wrong. They were twisted, eyes sunken, mouths open in silent screams. His stomach turned, and he wanted to leave, but his feet wouldn't move. From somewhere deeper in the house, Mark heard a soft, raspy voice. Come, come closer. He froze, his breath caught in his throat. The voice was unmistakably Mrs. Warwick's. But it sounded wrong, like it was coming from far away, echoing through time. Mark, Sophie's voice called from outside, but it felt distant, like a dream he was trying to wake from. Against every ounce of his better judgment, Mark took another step forward. The hallway seemed to stretch impossibly long as he approached a door at the far end. A faint light flickered from beneath it, and as he drew closer, the temperature dropped sharply, his breath visible in the cold air. His hand trembled as he reached for the doorknob, but before he could touch it, the door swung open on its own, revealing a small, dimly lit room. In the center of the room, hunched over in a rocking chair, was Mrs. Warwick. Her back was to him, her long gray hair hanging in matted strands over her shoulders. The chair creaked slowly as it rocked back and forth. I've been waiting, she rasped. Mark's throat tightened. His legs refused to move, his body frozen in place. Without turning, Mrs. Warwick spoke again, her voice low and venomous. They all come in the end. Suddenly, she stopped rocking, her head slowly turning to the side, just enough for Mark to see her face. Her skin was pale and gaunt, her eyes sunken deep into her skull, glowing faintly in the dim light. Her lips twisted into a cruel smile. They always do. The door behind Mark slammed shut with a deafening bang. He stumbled back, his heart racing, but it was too late. The room was closing in around him, the shadows creeping up the walls, swallowing the dim light. The air was thick, suffocating. Mark turned to the door, pounding on it with all his strength, but it wouldn't budge. His friend's voices outside were muffled, distant. And then he heard it, the sound of footsteps. Slow, deliberate, coming closer. He turned back toward Mrs. Warwick, but she was gone. The rocking chair sat empty, the room now deathly silent. Suddenly, a cold hand gripped his shoulder. Mark screamed. Outside, Jamie and Sophie waited, but Mark never came out. The next day, the police found the front door wide open, but there was no sign of Mark. The only thing they found was a new photograph on Mrs. Warwick's wall, a faded picture of a boy, his face twisted in terror, frozen in time. Story number five. In the small town of Ashford, nestled between dense woods and a sprawling lake, life moved at a slow and comforting pace. The neighbors knew each other by name, sharing stories over the white picket fences and tending to their gardens. But in one quiet corner of the neighborhood, there stood an old, dilapidated house, home to a reclusive woman named Margaret. Margaret was known to the townsfolk as the quiet neighbor. Her presence was a blend of intrigue and fear. She rarely ventured out, and when she did, it was for groceries late at night, always wrapped in a long, tattered coat, her silver hair tucked beneath a faded beanie. Rumors swirled around her like autumn leaves. Some claimed she was a witch, while others whispered that she was simply a lonely old woman mourning a lost family. No one knew for sure, and the mystery only deepened over the years. The new family that moved in next door, the Harrisons, were determined to befriend her. They were a young couple, Tom and Sarah, eager to settle into their new home. 
Their daughter, Lily, was a curious six-year-old with an insatiable imagination. She loved to explore the neighborhood, but she was particularly fascinated by the quiet house next door. One crisp autumn afternoon, Lily was playing in her yard when she noticed Margaret standing by the fence, staring at her. The old woman's eyes, a piercing blue, seemed to bore into Lily's very soul. Instead of feeling afraid, Lily waved enthusiastically. To her surprise, Margaret lifted a hand in greeting, a small smile breaking through her otherwise stern expression. Encouraged by the interaction, Lily decided to visit Margaret the next day. Armed with a plate of freshly baked cookies, she approached the old woman's house. The garden was overgrown, the path choked with weeds, but Lily pressed on, her heart racing with excitement. She knocked on the door, and after a moment of silence, it creaked open to reveal Margaret, looking taken aback. Hello, Miss Margaret. I brought you some cookies, Lily beamed, holding out the plate. Margaret hesitated, then took a step back. Thank you, dear, but I'm not hungry, she replied softly, her voice barely above a whisper. Lily, undeterred, peered into the dimly lit living room behind Margaret. It was cluttered with odd trinkets, jars filled with strange substances, and books stacked haphazardly. What's that? Lily pointed to a jar filled with what appeared to be glowing crystals. Margaret's eyes darkened, just something I collect. Now, you should go home, dear. Feeling a little frightened, but still curious, Lily nodded and waved goodbye, promising to return another day. As days turned into weeks, Lily continued her visits, each time bringing cookies or small drawings she made. With each visit, Margaret's demeanor softened. She began to share snippets of her life, recounting tales of her late husband and the daughter she lost to a tragic accident many years ago. Though the stories were tinged with sadness, they were also woven with hints of magic and wonder. However, the more time Lily spent with Margaret, the more her parents grew concerned. Tom and Sarah would often watch their daughter play with the old woman from their window, exchanging worried glances. They couldn't shake the feeling that there was something off about Margaret's house, an unsettling aura that seemed to linger in the air. One rainy evening, curiosity got the better of Tom. He decided to confront Margaret, hoping to understand her connection with Lily. As he approached the house, he noticed the curtains drawn tightly, the door slightly ajar. With a deep breath, he knocked. Margaret, he called out, stepping inside without an invitation. The air felt heavy, charged with an energy he couldn't quite place. Shadows danced along the walls, flickering as lightning illuminated the room. Who's there? A voice called from the back of the house. It was Margaret, her tone sharp and defensive. You shouldn't be here. I'm just here to check on Lily, Tom replied, trying to keep his voice calm. He could hear something rustling in the back room, a low, rhythmic sound like chanting. What are you doing? Suddenly, a sharp crash echoed from the back room, and Tom rushed forward, pushing through the doorway. What he saw sent a chill down his spine. Margaret was surrounded by a circle of candles, their flames flickering wildly. In front of her lay an intricate symbol drawn on the floor with what appeared to be salt. Get out, she screamed, her voice rising in panic. The shadows seemed to shift, growing darker and more oppressive. Tom turned to leave, but the door slammed shut behind him, Arvai trapping him inside. Lily, he shouted, his heart racing. Just then, he heard a faint whimpering sound. Turning around, he saw his daughter standing in the doorway, her face pale and wide-eyed. Daddy, she cried, running towards him. Before he could reach her, Margaret stepped between them, her eyes wild. You shouldn't have come here. She's not safe. What are you doing? Let her go. Tom shouted, feeling a surge of anger and fear. Margaret's expression shifted from panic to something almost serene. I'm trying to protect her, she said, her voice low and melodic. She has a gift, just like my daughter did. I lost her to darkness, and I won't let the same fate befall Lily. What darkness? Tom demanded, feeling helpless. Suddenly, the room filled with an overwhelming sense of dread. The shadows twisted and writhed, forming shapes that clawed at the edges of his vision. Tom could feel the air grow thick, making it hard to breathe. In that moment, he realized that the stories about Margaret weren't mere gossip. There was truth buried in them. The loss she had endured had driven her to the brink of madness, leading her to seek the dark powers she believed could save the innocent. Lily, come here! Tom shouted, holding his arms out to his daughter. 
but she stood frozen, entranced by the glow of the candles and the symbols on the floor. Margaret raised her hands, and the shadows coiled around her, responding to her command. I will protect her from the darkness, she screamed, as if trying to convince herself more than him. Just then, Sarah burst through the door, having followed Tom's frantic footsteps. She gasped at the sight, horror etched on her face. Tom, Lily, she cried, rushing towards her daughter. Stay back, Margaret yelled, her voice cracking. You don't understand what she's capable of. The tension in the room reached a boiling point. Tom grabbed Lily's hand, pulling her toward the door. We need to leave, now. The shadows flared and Margaret cried out in despair, her face contorting with grief. You can't take her away. She belongs with me. As they reached the door, Tom felt a tug on his heart. He turned back to Margaret, seeing the pain etched in her features. You can't protect her like this. You're only hurting her, he shouted, desperation clawing at his throat. In that moment, something shifted in Margaret's expression. The shadows around her wavered, and she seemed to deflate, the power draining from her as she realized the truth of her actions. Lily, she whispered, tears streaming down her face, I'm so sorry. With a final surge of energy, Tom flung open the door and he and Sarah rushed outside, pulling Lily with them. The shadows howled in fury as they escaped into the night, the storm raging behind them. As they reached their home, Tom turned to see the old house, now a silhouette against the lightning-lit sky. Margaret stood at the doorway, a frail figure lost in the tempest of her own making. For a moment, their eyes met, and he saw a flicker of the woman she once was, the loving mother and the neighbor who had long ago lost her way. From that night on, the Harrisons never spoke of Margaret again. They watched as her house fell further into disrepair, a ghost of what it once was. And though Lily grew up and moved away, the memory of the quiet neighbor lingered in her mind, a haunting reminder of the darkness that could dwell within even the most unassuming souls. Story number six. In the quaint town of Eldridge, neighbors always greeted one another with warm smiles and friendly waves. Among them was Mrs. Agatha Turner, an elderly woman known for her eccentricity and more notably her overwhelming love for animals. She had a small house at the end of Maple Street, but it was her yard that drew attention. The sprawling garden was filled with dozens of animals, from dogs and cats to rabbits and birds. To the children, she was the local pet lover, a figure who would often offer candy and animal-themed cookies, her laughter ringing like music in the air. However, there was something peculiar about Mrs. Turner. Her pets were never seen outside the yard, and visitors to her home often noticed an unsettling silence that lingered just beneath her cheerful exterior. The animals seemed to stare, their eyes glinting with an intelligence that felt almost human, and the faint sounds of whimpering could sometimes be heard if one got too close to her fence. The Johnsons, a young couple new to the neighborhood, soon found themselves drawn into the orbit of Mrs. Turner. With their small dog, Benny, they frequently passed her house on their evening walks. Mrs. Turner would be out in her garden, tending to her pets, and her warm invitations to visit often tugged at their curiosity. One summer evening, lured by the scent of fresh-baked treats wafting through the air, the Johnsons decided to stop by. As they approached, they noticed the yard was teeming with animals, all seemingly content but eerily still, as if waiting for something. Mrs. Turner greeted them at the door, her wrinkled face breaking into a wide smile. Come in, dears. I've baked some cookies for you and Benny, she exclaimed, her voice sweet like honey. Inside, the house was a labyrinth of knickknacks porcelain animals, paintings of pets, and an overwhelming number of pet-themed cushions decorated the furniture. The warm aroma of cookies filled the air, but the atmosphere felt heavy, almost claustrophobic. As they sat around her cluttered kitchen table, Mrs. Turner began sharing stories of her pets, her eyes gleaming with affection. She spoke of how each animal was special and how they all had a unique connection with her. The couple was charmed, but also unsettled by her intense devotion, it was clear that these pets meant everything to her. What do you do with them at night? Mr. Johnson asked, genuinely curious. Oh, they stay close to me. They wouldn't dream of wandering off, she replied, her gaze distant. They need my protection, and I need theirs. The couple exchanged glances, the hair on their necks prickling at her strange choice of words. They quickly finished their cookies and excused themselves, promising to return soon.
Days turned into weeks and the Johnsons found themselves increasingly uneasy. Benny started behaving strangely, barking at nothing and, and refusing to go near the fence that separated their yard from Mrs. Turner's. One night, the couple was awoken by an odd sound, a low, mournful howl that echoed through the darkness, sending chills down their spines. Did you hear that? Mrs. Johnson whispered, clinging to her husband. I did. It sounds like it's coming from Mrs. Turner's place, he replied, unease creeping into his voice. The next day, they decided to investigate. As they strolled past Mrs. Turner's house, they noticed something odd. The yard was unusually quiet. The pets were nowhere to be seen. Feeling a sense of dread wash over them, they pressed forward, curiosity piquing their interest. Mrs. Turner was in her garden, her hands stained with soil, and a strange smile graced her lips. Oh, hello, darlings, just tending to my little ones, she said, her voice cheerful but tinged with something darker. Where are your pets? Mr. Johnson asked, glancing around nervously. Oh, they're resting, she replied cryptically, brushing off the question. As they continued to chat, Mrs. Turner seemed to grow increasingly distracted, her gaze drifting to the far end of her yard where the shadows deepened. The Johnsons followed her gaze and noticed a small shed nestled between the trees, partially hidden from view. A cold shiver ran down Mrs. Johnson's spine. Is that where you keep them? She asked, her voice shaking slightly. Mrs. Turner's expression hardened. They're safe in there. Always safe. Suddenly, Benny began to bark furiously, pulling at his leash. The couple hurriedly left, unnerved by the entire exchange. That night, they lay awake in bed, the eerie howl echoing in their minds. What was happening in that shed? What secrets did Mrs. Turner keep hidden from the world? Determined to uncover the truth, Mr. Johnson hatched a plan. The following evening, after sunset, he would sneak over to Mrs. Turner's yard and take a look inside the shed. Mrs. Johnson was hesitant, warning him against it, but his curiosity was too strong. Under the cover of darkness, he tiptoed across the lawn, heart pounding in his chest. The air felt heavy, and the wind whispered warnings that sent shivers down his spine. He reached the shed, its door hanging slightly ajar, and peered inside. What he saw made his blood run cold. The interior was lined with cages, each one occupied by a pet, thin, frightened, and staring wide-eyed at him. He could see dogs, cats, and even a couple of rabbits, all looking gaunt and neglected. The overwhelming stench of decay hung in the air, making him gag. Just then, a soft whimper came from the shadows. Benny! The dog had somehow slipped through the fence and was trying to squeeze his way into the shed. Benny, no! Mr. Johnson hissed, but it was too late. The door creaked open wider and Mrs. Turner appeared behind him, her smile now twisted and menacing. What are you doing here? She demanded, her eyes glinting with anger. Mr. Johnson's heart raced. I, I was just checking on the pets, he stammered, backing away slowly. They're mine! She screamed, her voice echoing through the night. I care for them better than anyone else ever could. Realizing he was in grave danger, Mr. Johnson turned and bolted from the shed, Benny trailing closely behind. He could hear Mrs. Turner's furious footsteps behind him, her enraged shouts growing fainter as he sprinted toward home. Once safely inside, he slammed the door shut and locked it, gasping for breath. They called the police, but by the time officers arrived, Mrs. Wes, Turner's yard was once again silent, her house perfectly still. No one believed them. To the outside world, she was just the sweet old lady who loved her pets. Days turned into weeks, and Mrs. Turner's presence loomed over the neighborhood like a dark cloud. The Johnsons never ventured near her house again, but whispers of her eccentricity faded into the background. The howling returned on stormy nights, now accompanied by the chilling sound of scratching at the door. Eventually, the Johnsons decided to move away, desperate to escape the memory of their time in Eldridge. But the memory of Mrs. Agatha Turner, the pet lover neighbor, lingered like a ghost, a haunting reminder of the secrets that lay beneath the surface of a seemingly perfect life. As they packed their belongings, they couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was only when they glanced out the window one last time that they saw her standing at the end of the street. Surrounded by her pets, all of them staring intently at the moving truck, their eyes reflecting a knowing darkness. The Johnsons drove away, but as they left Eldridge behind, they knew they could never truly escape the shadow of the pet lover neighbor. Story number seven. The new family at 62 Willow Lane didn't know about Mr. Nolan, 
They had only moved in last week, unaware of the whispered warnings from the other neighbors, the sideways glances, and the subtle shifts in conversation when his name came up. To them, he was just the old man next door, quiet, reclusive, perhaps a little strange, but harmless. Or so they thought. Sarah, the teenage daughter, was the first to notice something odd about him. Every afternoon after school, she'd sit on the porch, headphones in, scrolling through her phone. And every afternoon, without fail, Mr. Nolan would appear. He'd stand at the window of his weathered old house, staring out at her, his eyes like cold steel, never blinking, never moving. At first, she thought nothing of it. Old people are nosy, she figured. But as the days went by, the staring didn't stop. In fact, it got worse. It was as though he was waiting for something, watching her every move like a predator sizing up its prey. One evening, Sarah mentioned it to her mom while they were setting the table for dinner. Mom, the guy next door is creepy. He's always watching me. Her mother frowned, looking out the window at Mr. Nolan's house. Oh, don't be silly, honey. He's just an old man. Maybe he's lonely. Sarah wasn't convinced, but she let it go. She didn't want to seem paranoid, especially in a new neighborhood. But later that night, as she was getting ready for bed, she noticed something that made her skin crawl. From her bedroom window, she had a perfect view of Mr. Nolan's house. And there, in the dim light of his living room, she saw him again, standing perfectly still, staring up at her window. Her heart pounded in her chest. She quickly closed the curtains and crawled into bed, her pulse racing. She tried to shake it off, telling herself it was just her imagination. But sleep didn't come easily that night, and when it did, the nightmares followed. In her dreams, Mr. Nolan wasn't just watching. He was in the house, creeping through the halls, his eyes glowing in the dark like two hollow orbs. His footsteps were silent, but she could feel his presence closing in on her, suffocating her. She woke up with a start, drenched in sweat, her heart hammering in her chest. For a long moment, she just lay there, listening to the silence of the house. But something was wrong. The air felt heavy, oppressive, like someone or something was watching her. Suddenly, there was a faint tap at the window. Sarah's blood ran cold. Slowly, she turned her head, her eyes locking onto the window across the room. The curtains were still drawn, but she could see a shadow shifting outside. Her breath caught in her throat as she slipped out of bed, her hands shaking. She reached for her phone, the dim light casting eerie shadows across the room, and texted her mom, who was asleep down the hall. Someone's outside. A few seconds later, her mom replied, Are you sure? Sarah's fingers flew across the screen. Yes, he's right outside my window. I think it's Mr. Nolan. Her mom texted back almost immediately. Stay in your room. I'll check. Sarah's heart pounded as she waited in the darkness. She could hear her mom's footsteps creaking down the hallway. Moments later, she heard the front door open. But then, nothing. Minutes passed, no footsteps, no sounds. Just an unnerving, suffocating silence. Sarah couldn't take it anymore. She crept toward the door and cracked it open, peeking down the hallway. The front door was still ajar, the night air wafting in. Her mom was nowhere in sight. Mom? Sarah called softly, stepping out into the hall. No response. Mom? She called again, her voice trembling now. She slowly descended the stairs, each creak of the floorboards making her heart race faster. She reached the front door and peered out into the yard, but her mom wasn't there. The street was empty illuminated only by the dim glow of the streetlights. Just as she was about to turn back inside, she noticed something odd, a light in Mr. Nolan's house. It was faint, barely visible through the cracked shutters of his living room window. Curiosity and fear drove her to take a few steps closer. The closer she got, the more her heart raced. She shouldn't be doing this, she knew that. But something was pulling her toward that house like an invisible force. When she reached the window, she pressed her face against the glass and peered inside. What she saw made her blood freeze. Her mom was standing in the middle of Mr. Nolan's living room, her eyes glazed over, her expression blank. She wasn't moving, wasn't blinking, just standing there, staring straight ahead. Behind her, in the corner of the room, stood Mr. Nolan. His face was twisted into a grotesque smile, his eyes gleaming with something dark and terrible. He was whispering though Sarah couldn't make out the words. And then, as if sensing her presence, he slowly turned his head toward the window, locking eyes with her. Sarah stumbled back, her heart slamming in her chest. She wanted to scream, but the sound caught in her throat. Her legs felt like lead, 
as she turned and ran back to her house, slamming the door behind her. She locked every door, every window, her mind racing. What was happening? What had he done to her mom? Suddenly, a loud knock echoed through the house. Sarah's breath hitched. The knock came again, this time louder, more insistent. She crept toward the front door, her hands trembling. Slowly, she reached for the handle, but just as her fingers brushed against it, she heard a voice. Sarah, open the door. It was her mom's voice, but something about it was off, flat, emotionless. Sarah, open the door, the voice repeated more urgent this time. But Sarah knew. That wasn't her mom anymore. She backed away from the door, tears streaming down her face as the knocking grew louder, more frantic. Sarah, open the door! Sarah, open the door! The voice grew more distorted, more inhuman with each knock, and then, just as suddenly as it started, the knocking stopped. For a long moment, there was only silence. Then, a whisper, so faint she barely heard it. I'm watching you. Story number eight. The town of Elmhurst had always been a peaceful place. Rows of neat houses stood side by side, their gardens well kept, and the people friendly enough to wave at each other every morning. Everyone knew their neighbors, except for the woman in house number 13. Her name was Mrs. Oliver, and she'd lived in that house for longer than anyone could remember. Unlike the other homes in Elmhurst, Mrs. Oliver's house was always dark, its windows covered with heavy curtains that never opened. The grass in her yard grew wild, and the paint on her front door was chipped and peeling. Though she'd lived there for decades, no one had ever seen her leave the house. Groceries would appear on her doorstep, delivered by a driver who never spoke, and any attempt to make contact was met with cold silence. The children of Elmhurst made up all kinds of stories about Mrs. Oliver. Some said she was a witch, others claimed she was a ghost, but none of them ever dared to approach her door except for Luke. Luke and his family had just moved into the house next door to Mrs. Oliver. He was a curious 11-year-old, with a knack for adventure and a habit of sneaking into places he shouldn't. His parents, busy with their new jobs, hadn't paid much attention to the rumors about the quiet neighbor. But Luke, fascinated by mystery, couldn't resist. One late afternoon, as the sun dipped behind the trees, casting long shadows across the street, Luke decided to investigate. He stood in his yard, staring, staring at the dark house next door, when he saw something move in one of the windows. A brief flicker, as if someone had been watching him. Intrigued, he wandered closer walking up to the overgrown lawn that surrounded Mrs. Oliver's house. He was careful to stay out of sight as he crept along the side of the building, his heart pounding in his chest. The air felt colder here, and an unsettling silence seemed to hang over the house. Finally, he made it to the side window where he'd seen the movement. He pressed his face against the dirty glass, trying to peer inside. It was dark, but he could make out the shape of furniture, covered in thick layers of dust. And then he saw her. A pale figure stood in the corner of the room, her back to him. She wore a long, old-fashioned dress, the fabric stained and tattered. Her hair, silver and thin, fell in tangled waves down her back. Luke's breath caught in his throat. This wasn't the Mrs. Oliver he had imagined. She seemed almost too still, too quiet, like she was barely alive. Suddenly her head snapped around, and Luke stumbled back from the window, his heart racing. She hadn't moved her body, just her head, turning impossibly far to look at him. Her eyes, sunken and hollow, locked onto his, and for a moment he couldn't move. Then, in a voice barely louder than a whisper, she spoke. You shouldn't be here. Luke turned and ran, not stopping until he was safely inside his own house. He slammed the door behind him, his heart pounding in his chest. For the next few days, he couldn't stop thinking about what he had seen. Who was Mrs. Oliver? and why did she never leave her house? Despite his fear, curiosity gnawed at him. He had to know more. A week later, he decided to go back, this time at night. He waited until his parents were asleep, then snuck out the back door and crept over to Mrs. Oliver's house. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and decay. The streetlights cast eerie shadows, and the wind rustled the trees, making them whisper secrets to one another. Luke approached the front door, his heart hammering in his chest. He reached out, hesitant but determined, and knocked softly. The door creaked open on its own. Luke swallowed hard and stepped inside. The air in the house was stale, filled with the scent of dust and something rotten. He could barely see, but a faint light flickered from deeper within, guiding him forward. 
As he walked, the floorboards creaked to his feet, each step echoing in the oppressive silence. The light led him to a small, dimly lit room. Mrs. Oliver sat in an old armchair, facing away from him. Her hair was wild, her frame impossibly thin. But something was off. Her movements were jerky, unnatural. She turned her head again, that same impossibly far turn, her eyes locking onto Luke's. But this time, she smiled. You came back, she said, her voice barely a breath. Luke's mouth went dry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to know why you never come outside. Her smile widened, revealing teeth that were too sharp, too pointed. There are things outside that I don't want to see, she whispered. Things that don't belong. Luke's blood ran cold. He wanted to run, but his legs wouldn't move. I've been watching you, Luke, she continued. You're curious, aren't you? You want to know what's inside this house, but some doors should never be opened. As she spoke, the room grew darker, the shadows lengthening and twisting unnaturally. Luke felt the temperature drop, the air around him growing heavier. Something was wrong, terribly wrong. He could feel it deep in his bones. Mrs. Oliver rose from her chair, her body moving in fits and starts, like a puppet controlled by invisible strings. You shouldn't have come here, she said, her voice echoing in the growing darkness. Now you've seen too much. Suddenly, the walls of the house seemed to close in, the shadows creeping toward Luke, wrapping around him like tendrils of smoke. He gasped for air, trying to escape, but his feet were rooted to the spot. Mrs. Oliver's face twisted into something monstrous, her eyes glowing with a sickly light. You can't leave now, Luke, she whispered, her voice turning into a growl. I've been waiting for someone like you. As the shadows closed in, Luke felt himself being pulled into the darkness. The last thing he saw was Mrs. Oliver's face, her smile wide and unnatural, as she whispered, Welcome home. The next morning, the Johnsons woke to find their son's bed empty. There was no sign of Luke anywhere, and despite a thorough search of the town, no one could find him. The police were called. Neighbors were questioned, but no one had seen him since the night before, except for Mrs. Oliver. But when they knocked on her door, there was no answer. The house remained dark, silent, and still, just as it always had been. Luke was never seen again. Story number nine. When Linda moved into her new house, she was excited to finally have a place to call her own. The street was quiet, and the neighbors seemed friendly. But one house in particular stood out to her. The ivy-covered cottage next door, where Mrs. Edith Whitaker lived. Mrs. Whitaker was an elderly woman known throughout the neighborhood as the Pet Lover, Cats lounged in her front yard, and the faint barks of small dogs could be heard through her open windows. She was always seen tending to her animals with a smile, a picture of kindness and compassion. Yet something felt off. There were always animals at her place, but Linda never saw them come or go. No one in the neighborhood could recall seeing Mrs. Whitaker actually walking her dogs or visiting a vet. Curious, Linda introduced herself one afternoon, hoping to get to know her new neighbor. Oh, you're the young lady who moved in next door. Mrs. Whitaker beamed, her smile revealing slightly yellowed teeth. Her voice was pleasant, but there was a sharpness in her eyes that sent a chill down Linda's spine. Why don't you come over for tea sometime? You must meet my precious little ones. Linda agreed, feeling a strange pull to visit the house. The very next evening, she found herself standing at Mrs. Whitaker's front door, her nerves tingling. When the door creaked open, Linda's breath caught in her throat. The house smelled strongly of animals, an overwhelming mix of fur, wet dog, and something else, something almost metallic that Linda couldn't place. Welcome, dear, Mrs. Whitaker greeted warmly. Come in, come in. The little ones are so excited to meet you. Linda stepped inside, her eyes adjusting to the dim lighting. The house was cluttered, filled with cages and shelves lined with old, dusty photographs of pets. Cats slinked past her legs, their fur brushing against her as they moved with silent grace. A tiny dog barked once from a nearby cage, and several birds fluttered in their enclosures, their feathers gleaming dully in the muted light. What a beautiful collection of pets you have, Linda said, forcing a smile. Mrs. Whitaker's grin widened. Oh, yes, they're my family. Every single one is precious to me. As they settled into the living room, Linda couldn't help but feel watched. The animals... Eyes seemed to follow her every movement, their gazes intelligent and unblinking. A black cat perched on a high shelf stared down at her, its eyes like twin pools of darkness. When it meowed softly, 
Mrs. Whitaker's expression turned almost tender. Ah, that's my dear Mr. Whiskers, she murmured. He's been with me for so long, haven't you, darling? Her voice was thick with affection, and she looked almost lost in a memory. Linda nodded slowly, glancing around the room. There were more photographs on the walls, old, yellowed pictures of Mrs. Whitaker as a young woman holding various animals. But something about the photos made Linda's stomach churn. The pets in the pictures, they were the same as the ones in the room. The same black cat, the same tiny dog, the same birds with the same distinctive markings. They were identical, as if they hadn't aged a day in all these decades. Um, Mrs. Whitaker, how old is Mr. Whiskers? Linda asked hesitantly. The old woman chuckled softly. Oh, time doesn't really matter when it comes to my little ones. They're special, you see. They stay with me forever. A cold shiver ran down Linda's spine. She tried to brush off the unsettling feeling, but as they continued to talk, more strange details began to emerge. The house was filled with the sounds of animals, yet the place felt devoid of life. No playful yips or contented purrs, just the constant, unwavering stares of animals that seemed far too aware. Would you like to see my most special pet? Mrs. Whitaker asked suddenly, her voice almost a whisper. Before Linda could respond, Mrs. Whitaker stood up and motioned for her to follow. They walked through a narrow hallway, past doors that Linda instinctively felt she shouldn't open. At the very end was a room with a heavy wooden door. Mrs. Whitaker paused, her hand hovering over the handle. He's been with me the longest, she murmured, a strange look in her eyes. He's the reason I can keep them all. Without him, they wouldn't stay. Linda's heart thudded painfully in her chest as Mrs. Whitaker pushed the door open. The room beyond was small and dark, filled with shadows, and in the center, chained to the wall, was something that made Linda's breath catch in her throat. It was a large dog, or at least it looked like one at first glance. Its fur was matted and patchy, its eyes a sickly yellow, but its body, it was twisted, elongated in ways that defied nature. Its limbs were too long, its spine bent at odd angles, and its mouth was filled with rows of jagged teeth that glistened in the dim light. It looked up at them, and Linda swore she saw something human in its gaze, a flicker of consciousness of pain and rage. Meet Balthazar, Mrs. Whitaker said softly. He's the one who keeps them with me. As long as he stays, so do they. Linda stumbled back, horror gripping her. What, what do you mean? Mrs. Whitaker's smile was serene, almost dreamy. Oh, Balthazar was a very bad man once. He hurt animals, broke their spirits, so I made him mine. And now he keeps my pets alive, keeps them with me forever. Linda's mouth went dry. She turned to run, but Mrs. Whitaker's frail hand shot out, grabbing her wrist with surprising strength. You can't leave yet, dear, she whispered, her eyes gleaming. You haven't met all my pets. The room seemed to close in around Linda, the shadows growing darker, thicker. She could feel them pressing against her, suffocating her. And then the animals began to move. The cats, the dogs, the birds... They stepped forward, their eyes glowing in the darkness. Slowly, deliberately, they surrounded her, their mouths opening in soundless cries. Please, Linda gasped, struggling to break free. But Mrs. Whitaker only smiled, her grip tightening. Shh, dear. You'll be happy here. You'll stay forever, just like them. The last thing Linda saw was the twisted grin of Balthazar, his eyes burning with an otherworldly light as the pets closed in, their bodies merging with the shadows until they swallowed her whole. The next morning, the neighborhood was quiet. Mrs. Whitaker tended to her garden, humming softly to herself. A new photo sat on her living room shelf, a picture of Linda smiling and holding a small black cat with eyes like twin pools of darkness. The neighbors passed by, waving and smiling at Mrs. Whitaker, never noticing the new cat perched on her windowsill, staring out at the world with a gaze that seemed far too human. Story number 10. When the old Whitlock house finally sold after years of vacancy, no one in the neighborhood was surprised. But they were shocked to learn who bought it. Mr. Emerson, the grumpiest man on the block. He had lived two streets over for decades, and everyone knew him for his sour face, his constant complaining, and his bizarre obsession with keeping his lawn immaculate. But what most people didn't know was the rumor that followed him like a dark cloud. People said his wife had disappeared under mysterious circumstances years ago, and Emerson never spoke of her again. Probably scared her off with that attitude, people joked. But there were whispers of darker things, too, things no one dared to say aloud. Um, 
The Whitlock House itself had a history. It sat on the edge of town, surrounded by dense woods. The last family who lived there had left in the dead of night. No notice, no explanation. Before them, there were similar stories. Families came and went, always leaving abruptly. Some said the house was cursed, others claimed it was haunted. The truth was, no one knew for sure, but they all agreed it was bad news. So when Mr. Emerson moved in, people shook their heads and wondered why. But it wasn't long before they noticed something was off, even more off than usual. Claire, a high school senior who lived across the street, was one of the first to notice. She'd see him standing in the window late at night, staring out at the road with a strange, vacant expression. He never moved, never blinked, just stared. It creeped her out, but she brushed it off. Old man's just weird, she told herself. Then, one day, while walking home from school, Claire saw Mr. Emerson outside. He was standing on his front lawn, staring down at something in the grass. His lawn had always been pristine, but now there were strange, dark patches spreading across it, as if the grass had died overnight. Curiosity got the better of her, and Claire crossed the street. As she got closer, she noticed the patches weren't just dead grass. They were circles, perfectly round, scattered across the yard like some kind of pattern. Emerson stood in the middle of them, his face twisted in concentration. Mr. Emerson? Claire called, trying not to startle him. He didn't respond. He just stood there, still as a statue, his eyes fixed on the ground. Mr. Emerson, are you okay? His head snapped up so suddenly that Claire took a step back. His eyes were wild, almost feverish. You see them, don't you? Claire blinked, confused. See what? The holes, he muttered, his voice low and shaky. They're everywhere. Watching. Waiting. Claire glanced down at the lawn again. It's just dead grass. He shook his head violently. No, no, it's not. They're getting closer. They've been waiting for me. A chill ran down Claire's spine. She took a cautious step back, forcing a smile. I think you should get some rest, Mr. Emerson. Maybe call someone to look at the lawn. But he just stared at her, unblinking, his eyes filled with something dark and unreadable. Claire didn't wait for a response. She hurried home, glancing back once to see him still standing there, watching her. That night, she couldn't shake the image of his face, those wild eyes, the desperation in his voice. She lay in bed, tossing and turning, with her mind replaying the strange encounter over and over again. Something was wrong with Mr. Emerson, more than just his usual grumpiness. She thought about telling her parents, but they'd probably just shrug it off. So instead, she decided to do some investigating of her own. The next afternoon after school, Claire made her way back to Mr. Emerson's house. She kept her distance this time, staying hidden behind the thick bushes that lined the edge of his property. The dead patches of grass were worse now, more of them, and they seemed to form some kind of crude pattern, circles within circles, spiraling out across the yard. Mr. Emerson was nowhere to be seen. Claire took out her phone and snapped a few pictures, intending to show them to her friends later. But as she zoomed in on one of the patches, something strange caught her eye. In the center of one of the dead spots, barely visible, was a dark, jagged hole. She frowned, lowering her phone. The hole wasn't large, maybe the size of a dinner plate, but it was deep. Too deep for a patch of dead grass. And as she looked closer, she realized there were more of them. Small, almost hidden by the grass, scattered throughout the yard. A cold wind swept through the trees and Claire shivered. Something about those holes made her skin crawl. They looked unnatural, like they didn't belong there. Just as she was about to step back, she heard the sound of a door creaking open. Claire's heart skipped a beat as she crouched lower, peeking through the bushes. Mr. Emerson had come outside. He stood on the porch for a moment, for a moment then slowly, methodically began to walk toward one of the holes. He didn't say anything. He didn't even seem to notice the wind picking up, the sky growing darker. He just walked, his eyes fixed on the ground. And then, to Claire's horror, he knelt down beside one of the holes, reaching out with trembling hands. Claire held her breath as Mr. Emerson dug his fingers into the earth, widening the hole. His breathing was ragged, and there was a strange, low humming sound coming from somewhere deep within the ground. The air felt thick, charged with something Claire couldn't explain. Suddenly, Emerson let out a choked gasp. He yanked his hand back, something black and writhing clutched in his fist. Claire's heart raced as she watched him struggle with the thing in his hand. Whatever it was, 
It was alive, twisting and curling like a mass of dark tendrils. Emerson muttered something under his breath, his voice frantic, terrified. And then, before Claire could react, the ground beneath him began to move. The hole widened, the earth shifting, and from the dark, something began to rise. It was slow at first, like it was being pulled up from the depths of the earth itself. A mass of black, twisting shadows. A shape that was almost human, but not quite. Emerson screamed. The thing wrapped itself around him, pulling him toward the hole, dragging him down. He fought, but it was no use. The darkness consumed him, pulling him into the earth, swallowing him whole. Claire clapped a hand over her mouth, her eyes wide with horror. In seconds, Mr. Emerson was gone. The ground shifted, and the hole sealed itself as if nothing had ever been there. Claire didn't stay to watch. She ran, her legs shaking, her heart pounding in her chest. She didn't stop until she was home, slamming the door behind her, locking every window. No one ever saw Mr. Emerson again. The next morning, the dead patches were gone, and the grass looked greener than ever. But Claire knew what she'd seen, and she knew the thing in the ground was still there, waiting, watching.